So most of you are probably pretty familiar with this, but uh, you know, energy markets are now running at least most of the load in, the, in North America. Uh, parts of the West are still run primarily as, as you know, independent utilities doing hourly scheduling, cross transmission with each other. But here in the Midwest, of course, we've got the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator. So these ISOs or RTOs, as they're known, you know, run a, an energy market. And this has allowed a lot of independent power companies to come in and just be, you know, generate and sell uh, energy into these markets as well. Uh, basically, they run an hour ahead market. Uh, a, a real-time market is usually doing five-minute type dispatch uh, where they're telling every unit exactly how much power to actually deliver every five minutes. And then they're having a market or uh, purchases of ancillary products as well for reliability. This is pretty true across all the markets, uh, especially the eastern markets here. Uh, California, I think, is always a little bit odd, but uh, that's California. They're trying new things out there all the time. And I, I think you understand the, the location generally. I won't get into the details, obviously, about locational marginal price. but um, you know, if there's a transmission, well, if there's no transmission constraint, then everybody is part of the same power pool, and the most economic generator will run to uh, to meet load. If there is a constraint, then you'll figure out the most economic way of working around that constraint to uh, satisfy load at the lowest cost using uh, the generators that can deliver it. And so you might end up with different prices at different nodes in the system. And then, of course, energy is not enough. You have reserves for your your large contingency events. These are usually in the form, of course, spinning reserve or, or non-spinning reserve based on the speed that they have to respond. And you also have products like regulation, uh, reactive voltage, black start, other, other ancillary services you need for reliability. And then we mentioned this issue about how do you do long-term planning with this. A lot of discussion right now, like down in Texas and other markets, about uh, capacity markets. Uh, as we were talking about, if you get a lot of renewable energy in, it does tend to, de to depress the real-time prices a bit, so if you're getting less revenue in the energy market and you still want to build other types of plants for reliability, do we have to get into capacity payments or some other uh, you know, revenue assurance type payments out in California to, to deal with uh, the longer term revenue you need to actually support and especially build new plants? A complicated area as we, as we filter out how we're going to tune these markets for this. The, uh, the fact that can't be denied, though, is that these large markets actually do make it a lot easier to integrate variable generation because you've got a much larger pool of, uh, of generators that are all you know, part of, under the control of the ISO in terms of how they're running. Uh, a, a, a key part of this really comes down to the, the dispatch stack. I mean, if you're worried about ramping in real time, we get into a large system like MISO, You've got you know, hundreds of units that are available to move up or down even a small amount on a five minute by five minute basis. You've got a lot of flexibility essentially for free right there because if they're all at the, the marginal price, you can nudge those around with essentially no cost impact. I mean, you can't beat that in terms of a cheap way of getting flexibility. Now, you, might, you know, still might need to get into reserves of some sort or new ramping type reserves if you're worried about you know, exhausting that. But if you've got a lot of players that are all participating in the market and allowing their plants to be dispatched, it's a very good situation with a lot of flexibility for dealing with variability. Let's look at MISO a little bit more closely because they're doing a, a very fascinating thing over the last couple of years. Uh, the MISO market is a, a pretty classic, what they call day two market, where you submit your day ahead offer by about 10 a.m. our time here every day for the hour by hour for the next day. Uh, you have some ability to adjust how you satisfy that, that offer up to about four hours ahead because four hours comes largely from when you can start a gas plant if you have to change something in the system, right? And then you get to the real-time operating hour. 30 minutes ahead of the hour, you can offer additional energy into the real-time market uh, and you have to do it 30 minutes ahead. And then MISO is going to turn around and look at for every five minutes uh, in real-time, they're going to give you a, a dispatch signal saying, you know, this is what you said you could do economically. I want this amount, this exact amount of power from you for this coming five minute period. You're expected to get to that dispatch point by the end of that five minute period. And you're expected to follow that dispatch signal within about plus or minus 8% of what they tell you to do. If you're outside of that, you're going to be subject to penalties, right? And so everything is in here. It's uh, economic optimization where they're, they're, they're satisfying both uh, economics and reliability by how they dispatch all these units. And everything settles out in terms of who gets paid what. And it's all based in the, the real-time dispatch runs with this, this, what they call the security-constrained economic dispatch. 
just figuring out the, the best way of satisfying reliability and satisfying the, the load, meeting the load obligation every five minutes. Now when wind came on into MISO, they're getting thousands of megawatts of wind. And uh, initially wind was in what they call an intermittent resource tariff, which basically means that uh, we will dispatch you as much, you know, we'll, we'll use whatever energy you can give us, more or less. You're just gonna be a price taker in the real time market, right? Uh, but you're not really following a dispatch point. We're not expecting you to follow this. We'll take whatever energy you can. Now, of course, this is pretty disruptive to this optimal plan because you've got all this additional energy kind of pouring into the market. More than that, you know, they're not really f doing a five minute dispatch of wind. So they don't have a whole lot of control. Uh, literally, you know, they would have to pick up the phone to call a wind plant and say, hey, I got a transmission constraint. You've got to shut down right now. And the, you know, the, the wind plant would be saying, well, what are you talking about? You know, your price is still up at $40. You're just telling me to shut down. Why should I shut down? You know, well, we, we, we don't have the transmission to get you into the system anymore. And it takes time, very inefficient. So MISO was looking at this and saying, you know, is there a way to actually get wind to essentially voluntarily, in a sense, participate in the market? Can I at least get them to where I can get them into the real-time market? And they made one very elegant change actually to this plan, which instead of 30 minutes ahead, they said, okay, I'll let wind actually do a rolling five minute forecast. And I'll take the point that is as close to time zero as I can, about 10 minutes ahead as their forecast. I'll put that into my security constrained economic dispatch optimization, and I'll include wind in that optimization, and then I'll actually give wind a dispatch point, and I'll expect them to follow that dispatch point just like any other generator. And if they don't, I will penalize them just like any other generator. Now, why does this make sense at all? Well, it comes back to this curve we looked at before, right? And if I blow up just a couple hours of this, what they're saying is I'll actually allow wind to schedule in very close, 10 minutes ahead, where the error is very low. The difference is if I was expecting them to, to schedule in, you know, 30 minutes ahead of the hour, you got this, you know, hour ahead kind of forecast, the error is going to be many times higher if I have to give you that forecast than if I give you one 10 minutes ahead. In fact, if you're doing a 10 minute ahead forecast, you actually are down at the point of just a percent or two error, which looks just like load error. It looks, in fact, very comparable to the ability of most uh, conventional plants to follow a dispatch signal, right? So you're down to where wind actually looks like it is just like anybody else. Now this is a very elegant solution to the problem getting into the real time market in my view, right? It also kind of changes your whole definition of variability because now we're really concerned primarily with the variability within that five minute dispatch period, right? And that may use some additional regulation, but Given the size of MISO, they're claiming that they're now integrating wind with this approach without even increasing their regulation need at all, right? And, and by the way, now most of the wind, you know, this, this is what they call the dispatchable intermittent resource tariff in MISO. Uh, over the last two years, essentially all wind newer than about 2005 has been required to, to move into this tariff. So about 80% of the wind in MISO is now part of this tariff and is being dispatched every five minutes. Now, wind plants did have to put in, you know, an electronic and ICCP link to get that signal, get that dispatch point. They had to maybe change how they interface that data with their SCADA system so the wind plant actually can vary its output by feathering blades and turbines and so forth. So there was some cost in this, sometimes on the order of several hundred thousand dollars per wind plant. But it's been done. Uh, w you know, wind plants are in here. They're following dispatch. So once you've got this, so the concept of variability is mainly in that five-minute period. The uncertainty is still there, but it's mostly the uncertainty from the day ahead forecast, you know, because that is going to have a higher error rate. But interestingly, most of the uh, wind plant operators have also figured out that as long as I've got a, a well-functioning market like in MISO, and I can, I can clear this in the real-time market and do my settlement there, the real-time price differential compared to day ahead is usually not very big in MISO, I might as well be in the day ahead market too because I get other revenues from being in the day ahead market. Like I can participate in financial transmission rights. So I, can, I can sell other ancillary products in some cases, things like that. So there's reasons why they want to do that. So most of them now are actually scheduling in the day ahead market as well with at least most of their day ahead forecast. Some of them like Detroit Edison have just said publicly that, you know, we don't want to be perceived as 
trading, you know, kind of guys. We just want, we're going to put our full day ahead forecast in. We're just going to run it out. We're in the daytime with the, you know, real time. And that works fine for us. I think others are probably maybe putting in, you know, 80% of their day ahead or something like that and flowing more into real time. But there's ways to do this to optimize this. And so do you have a flexibility problem uh, in a system like MISO? You really, you really don't. Uh, they, they seem very comfortable with uh, integrating a lot more wind because of the depth and flexibility of the real-time dispatch stack. You know, think about it this way too. You can, so you got a, you know, the wind, you got a lot of wind on the system. The wind is high right now. Well, that means that you probably back down a lot of your conventional units to deal with that cheap energy. So a lot of them are sitting there in the dispatch stack more than happy to ramp up if, if wind ramps down. Similarly, if wind is very low, well, then you're probably using a lot of your combined cycle and so forth at a high level already. It's sitting there. It's at least available to, to back down if wind ramps up quickly. You know, so it tends to actually work really well in a well-functioning real-time market. If you don't have a well-functioning real-time market, well, then you've got a much bigger issue with flexibility. And I think that's what they're saying to some extent, like in California, where you know, something on the order of like 80% of the units self-schedule rather than allow themselves to be dispatched by the ISO. So you just you don't have the, the population of, of units you can nudge around, right? Well, of course you're worried about flexibility. But why don't you fix your market so you do? You know, why don't you get them in so you've got everybody participating in the market? You know, those are the sorts of uh, debates going on out there right now. Yes? So, so with wind coming in and being part of the mix, there, some of the conventional units that are, are being moved around much more it really depends on the region of the country and what's on the margin, right? Uh, what's on the margin in the market because, uh, and, and low gas prices have been very disruptive here too, right? So if, if gas gets so cheap that it's actually cheaper than coal, then you're running a lot of these gas units as base load and the coal starts ramping more. If gas price goes up a bit, then you're back to where you're probably the more conventional using the coal as the cheapest source and then it's gas at the margin. Uh, so it does vary, and that's, that's, if you look at integration studies across the country, that's the big variable, is uh, the, the generator mix and the fuel cost, you know, what, what gas price do you assume? And that will change it. But it, it could cause certain other units to do more ramping or be, at least be nudged around more in, uh, in the, the real-time dispatch. But keep in mind that they're still only changing the dispatch within the stated ramp offer from all the units. Right, so this is the ramp rate you said you could handle economically. Uh, the real benefit of a large real-time market, of course, is that you, you don't need individual units to move around a lot if you've got a large population of units that can all move a little bit, right? That's still the cheapest way of doing it without imposing a lot of ramping costs. So this, this really kind of does the trick of uh, it gets these units in. As I said, most of the wind in MISA now is also in the day-ahead market now that this is functioning pretty well. Uh, and uh, it, it really also aligns the forecasting time points pretty well with the market risk and, and opportunities, right? Because the day ahead forecast doesn't have to be perfect as long as I can financially make sense about putting it in and dealing with that, that uncertainty of the forecast financially in the day ahead market. I, I need a good physical, you know, real time because I'm going to be dispatched to that. So I've got to have that low air dispatch point. So this, is, you know, this works where you get wind fully into the market as a market participant in MISO today. And it would never, ever, ever work if you were trying to schedule wind you know, 30 minutes ahead of an hour. The wind folks would be saying this is impossible. Given the, just given the implicit nature of weather that drives my fuel, I can't possibly stay within a plus or minus 8% of your dispatch if you're forcing me to schedule that in an hour or two ahead. It just physically will never work. But if you could let me do it, you know, five, ten minutes ahead, yeah, I can, I can do that. I'm not outside of that, that uh, dispatch tolerance band too often, okay? So it's a very elegant approach for integrating wind. The other thing, the question people sometimes ask me, well, a lot of wind is under PPAs. You know, it's under contracts where you're, you've got a must-take contract. Well, that's not stopping most of the folks from unbundling this and putting wind into this market. You can still do that, of course, even though you've got a power purchase agreement where you're agreeing to buy power. Uh, you can still, you know, actually inject that, sell that power into the market where it's generated at that node, buy the power out at the point where you're serving your load, 
and use the financial transmission right as your insurance against congestion that would cause any price difference between those nodes. So this really becomes just a financial issue putting this into the market. It really doesn't interfere with your underlying PPA contract if you think this through. In fact, you know, as you know, most of the power is, is often under bilateral agreements. That doesn't mean you can't be a full market participant uh, because this is a bilateral agreement plant or something like that. So just something to keep in mind. The other thing to, to mention just in passing is that we're pretty used to a five-minute uh, real-time market here in our part of the world now, now that we have MISO. Uh, large parts of the West you know, are still doing just hourly transmission scheduling uh, and don't have any, any real-time market. But there's a very interesting development with that. Uh, they've been talking about what they call an energy imbalance market. You know, even for parts of the West where market is a dirty word, uh, they're saying, you know, boy, it's a lot cheaper to do this sort of real-time market where we use the, the most economic unit to deal with imbalance in real time. So uh, Pacificor uh, signed a deal with, uh, with California ISO to create a, a larger you know, Western, essentially it's the real-time market. It's, it's essentially a voluntary five-minute market. The difference is you, know, you don't have to. You only offer in the units you want. And it's only going to use transmission capacity that's otherwise going to be unused. It's not otherwise reserved. But you're just agreeing to say, OK, I'll offer these units in. And if people have imbalance, they can buy at a real-time price. And we'll both win because I make money and you get cheaper power you know, from doing this. So this is just kicking off. They're in the process of designing this and implementing it for the, uh, the non-market West. California will host it and make an extension to their real-time market, essentially. Uh, Pacific Core is in. It's very likely that, uh, that others, I think, in the West will, I think, hopefully join in once they look at this and look at how much this is going to save them in terms of their, uh, their running their power system. So uh, we'll see what happens with this over the next couple of years. Mark, on the previous slide, you had the term LMP. The lo locational marginal price. Yeah, that's the, when I was looking briefly at how you run these markets, the, the LMP would just be the, the pricing node at your plant or at your load, right? So the, you know, you get, you get a separate price in the market for every, every LMP node, or they call it a, a CP node, a, commercial pricing node and MISO, I think it is. So that the only problem you have, if you, if you want to move power from here to there, you do it in market by just offering it in at your LMP and buying it back the other one, and, and MISO takes care of scheduling the transmission for you, basically, right? The only problem is, okay, that, that's a break even for you if there's no price difference between those nodes, but if there's a transmission constraint that causes a price differential between those nodes, then you might end up kind of losing money by, because of the price difference. And you can insure against that with other types of products like, like financial transmission rights. Okay. Okay. So given you've got a well-functioning market system like we're seeing in MISO, what does it actually cost us to integrate wind once you have taken this step and done something like this? A lot of the integration studies have been, you know, over the years, like in uh, 2006 here in Minnesota, we saw a an integration cost of about $4.60 as the perceived cost of integrating wind to cover the, the variability and uncertainty of wind you know, relative to an ideal generator kind of thing, right? So more or less, you know, you, that would it, that's what it would cost you to turn it into a very efficient gas plant or something like that from, from a point of view. But you know, it kind of changes your even perception once you get into this five-minute dispatch a bit. Because uh, it, it's really just the variability within that dispatch. And then you're left with this day ahead uncertainty and how you're dealing with that within the market system. So an interesting thing happened here. Uh, great guy down in ERCOT, Dave Maggio, did an analysis and presented this a couple of years ago at the IEEE Power and Energy Conference. He said, you know, uh, in ERCOT, we actually even go a step beyond MISO at this point. They take the latest telemetry value from the wind plant, which is only like two minutes ahead of their five minute dispatch period. And they're able to quickly run their, their five-minute dispatch optimization, their security-constrained economic dispatch, and issue the dispatch points out to everybody. So quite honestly, it's just you know, whatever the value is at the start of the five-minute period is, is basically what wind is expected to be at the dispatch if it's not constrained. And the variability is just the shaded area for every five-minute period. So they've looked at this and said, OK, in ERCOT, we're using regulation to cover that variability within the five-minute period. So how much is that costing us? 
So he took the first 10 months of the ERCOT nodal market when they rolled it out in uh, 2011, basically, and he actually recalculated all of their regulation and said, what if there had been no variability from wind within the five minute dispatch periods at all? And he looked at how much regulation they, you know, they would have been able to reduce from that. He, he priced that in the real time regulation market in Texas and came up with, you know, it, it varies from month to month. And there's one month that was crazy. This uh, August of 11 was the huge heat wave in Texas where they had $2,000 power prices all the time. Of course, regulation prices were high as well. But he looked at this and he said, well, in the typical months, you know, it's costing me about 500K per month in kind of incremental regulation to deal with wind variability. If you include August, maybe a million, okay? And then he took a look at, he said, well, what about the uncertainty, the day ahead forecast uncertainty? You know, I, I had this forecast and this was what actually showed up that particular time. So this is uh, my day ahead uncertainty. Now they're going to use their real-time dispatch for most of this, just like MISO does, but they do increase the amount of non-spinning reserve because they allow non-spin to be used for a forecast error in ERCOT. And they said, uh, well, how much additional non-spin am I actually procuring to deal with for day ahead forecast error? And he did the same sort of analysis. He said, what if the day ahead forecast had been perfect? How much would I have uh, procured of non-spin? What's the difference? What did that cost in the, the real-time markets? And he came out with a number of about a million dollars per month typical on that. Now this is with the ERCOT system with uh, 10,000 megawatts of wind, about, about nine or 10 percent of their energy. So not unlike what we're dealing with here in MISO at this point, right? And so if you look at those numbers, you end up with, you know, total cost of dealing with it in this point of view of, you know, roughly uh, 66 cents per megawatt hour of the wind energy delivered to the ERCOT market. You know, so it's 18 million bucks, but that was $1.3 billion worth of energy delivered to the market in that same year, right? So it's only about one to 2% you know, of the energy value that would be attributed to the in, you know, integration because of variability and uncertainty in the ERCOT market, which is even lower than what we've seen in a lot of the integration studies. I think largely because you're changing your definition a little bit about variability and uncertainty once you look at it in this market context. Whereas even in the 2006 study in Minnesota, I think we were looking a little bit more in the, the traditional utility operations context about how it was impacting you, right? So these market systems really do uh, quite the job for integrating this, this variability and uncertainty. The other thing to keep in mind is, uh, I mean, some people would look at this and say, well, yeah, but it's still 18 million bucks. You know, shouldn't that be a, kind of a, a cost that's uh, you know, allocated back to wind? It, you know, maybe, but keep in mind that we have lots of other ancillary services costs and operating costs that we look at as a system optimization of benefits load. And we don't, we don't for example, bill back the units that are contributing to uh, the contingency reserve based on the cost of the contingency reserves we're buying. And we view that as just part of running the system that society and other, other people tell us to run, basically. And as a system operator, you know, it's their job to really optimize that and get the, the most economic and reliable power for serving load. So you can get into a lot of cost allocation uh, type discussions, but uh, I tend to think we ought to focus more about, you know, let's worry about system optimization. And, uh, you know, the, all, the, all types of generators have different costs and benefits. Uh, you get into slicing and dicing all this back to everybody individually. We're going to spend a lot more time sending bills than we are actually running the system. And I think that's uh, probably not in the best interest of load in the long run either. So. Make sense? So it's pretty impressive. I mean, they're, they're doing this. I, I don't, you know, will this go up with higher wind penetrations? A little bit, yeah, it will. But I don't think we're anywhere close to seeing any sort of hockey stick where you hit the wall and you, you suddenly don't have any economic way of doing this, you know. We're gonna continue to engineer better solutions. We'll deal with this. But they're running simulations in a lot of the integration studies today that are being funded by Department of Energy and run by folks like NREL. I mean, we're studying 30 and 40 45, 50% penetrations very carefully. We still don't see a dramatic increase in integration cost for this. You know, it's anything more than just kind of a, a gradual increase with penetration levels. Yes, when Terry. When you do those simulations, do they just keep putting in uh, future transmission? It's, the question is about what's the transmission build out to allow this? Yeah, you've, you've got to come up with some future transmission scenario. Like here in a lot of the studies in this region, it's been, you know, it's been based on what we're doing with, with MVPs and with uh, 
you know, our transmission planning that we're doing in this part of the country. So they've got to have a, a, an assumption about what transmission will be there. But in most cases, they're not you know, explicitly building transmission as part of the modeling effort. They're taking one of the other studies that have been done about what people think should happen. There's a lot of variables in the power system, as you know, right? Uh, so it's based on your assumptions. So we have to keep this in mind. You know, I mentioned that uh, you know, all units actually have an integration cost. In fact, keep this in mind, especially in the, the system of the future. Okay, if all this flexibility in the dispatch stack becomes very important for dealing with our current and future power system, well, what happens if you add in a very large baseload unit at this point? Well, that could actually have a very high integration cost when you think of it in this way, because you're moving the dispatch stack up. You might be nudging a lot of the more flexible units completely off of the dispatch stack where they're not even running anymore. Therefore, you've lost all that flexibility. So at this point, now, what's the integration cost of a baseload unit? Or even, you know, we, we, buy, we buy flat blocks of power. I mean, flat blocks of power are flat, and they have edges. We create a ramp with that edge. Uh, do we really want flat power anymore? Or, you know, if we look at this in the future context of, well, this is a, a system balancing problem, you know, we probably want flexibility more than we want flat blocks, right? You know, so we gotta, gotta weigh what's the cost benefit of this. You know, it's not a new problem. Gener variable generation is not creating this, but it definitely is forcing us to kind of think about this a lot more carefully and probably change our value points on what we do going forward. I, you know, I keep stressing to people though, you know, as engineers, as people that run the power markets, you know, our, our job is to serve load uh, and optimize the system, uh, you know, Especially with renewables, you know, it's, it's legislation, it's po public policy that's driving a lot of the build out of this. So we may not be able to say exactly what we want built, uh, you know, precisely. But we've got to figure out how to run it. We've got to figure out how to, how to run the system as a whole. And I think that's enough of a problem. We've got to focus on that and really worry about system optimization as much as we can. So just to sum up here, you know, with you can make wind a full market participant. You, you've got to do it with this forecast that's within a few minutes of real time or it simply won't work for dispatching wind. I think anything, you know, anybody that's trying to do it you know, hour ahead is wasting their time. It just won't really look like a real power plant. We still are left with this ramping uh, and uh, a lot of the attention now is on how we're going to get better forecasts around ramping, do a better job of setting up for that because that's going to be increasingly important. Well, we got wind pretty well figured out here, right? Uh, now, here's solar build out in California for the last couple of years. Uh, they're up over 2,000 megawatts in terms of their, their PV capacity alone, not counting their thermal solar plants. About half of this is customer sited, about half of it is utility scale. If you look at the daily load shape, you know, look at the shape of this thing. Over 2,000 megawatts. It peaks right around the middle of the day, falls off at both ends, right? You can see half and half, half, half utility scale, half of it is distributed, sitting out on people's rooftops out there. That's a lot of, a lot of power. You can't ignore 2,000 megawatts and it's growing. They're expected this to double by 2020, at least, right? So think of what that does to your load curve when you get that much solar all in the afternoon. I mean, the, the other generators are just being pushed down as this grows. Here in Minnesota, we're also not immune to this. This, this is uh, the latest legislation, right? This was just passed in the last session uh, for the investor-owned utilities. There's now a requirement of one and a half percent of energy sales from solar by 2020, which will build out about 450 megawatts of new solar here in Minnesota. A fair percentage of that is encouraged to be small rooftop, you know, residential type projects. Uh, there's talk about a goal in there about eventually having 10% of our energy from solar. Uh, you know, there's some other made in Minnesota type incentives. Uh, community solar gardens, interesting concept of saying, you know, I may not want to put panels on my roof, but I might be quite willing to actually buy shares of a community project. Suppose somebody builds a one megawatt project in my county or the next county over. I can buy a piece of that and utility has to treat that just like it was on my roof, right? 
And I, I'd be much more willing personally to probably invest in that than to put panels on my shingles, but you know, this is going to make it interesting. The net metering cap, meaning on this distributed, you know, when can you run the meter backwards essentially? It was 40 kW, it's now being increased to one megawatt. Now you don't get paid full retail all the way up, you get paid retail for the first 40 kW and avoided cost after that. But you know, a one megawatt net metering project is a pretty big chunk, right? And then there's this really interesting thing that's stuck in there called the value of solar tariff. Uh, and uh, Excel, anyway, I know really supported this. And they've been talking about very similar things they'd love to have out in their, their, uh, their Colorado region because they're getting really concerned about net metering. And this is a, a new approach for uh, calculating how solar will be paid. And uh, the state is going to start public hearings on this, public meetings in September, run through the fall. By the end of January, they're going to come out with a published methodology approved by the PUC. The IOUs can take this methodology, they can do this calculation according to it, come up with a number, and use that to replace the net metering retail rate and pay, pay the distributed solar, this value of solar tariff rate instead. And by the way, the state law says at least for the first three years, this value of solar rate will be higher than retail rate. Now why would you want to pay higher than retail rate for distributed solar? Well, here's the value of solar approach. It, in order to do it, it requires that you separately meter the solar generation from the consumption at the residence, right? So you're going to calculate the, the PV generation and pay them at this, this value of solar rate. They're still going to pay just as much as ever before for their, their use at the site at the retail rate. Now, why is this important? Well, out in Phoenix, they've had people putting on uh, these PV panels on their roof. Their, their monthly bill goes from an average of like $240 per month. And once they put on the PV, it goes down to $70, right? And they're looking at this to say, well, this is a problem because you know, a lot of our other rate recovery is tied in with our energy sales. So if they're not buying energy from me, I'm not recovering the, 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 the way to pay for the rest of my system. I, I'm providing them with reliability services that they're not paying for anymore. This becomes a reverse Robin Hood effect where the poor people that can't afford to put on PV are going to have to pay for more of the system costs. And uh, not only that, but the people with PV, they're often under a time of day rate where the power they are buying at night is so cheap you know, that they're, they're certainly not paying their fair share according to uh, Public Service Colorado. So, uh, so Public Service Colorado said, okay, well, we're going to have to create a, a, a load charge, a demand charge here for residences. We're going to add on 45 to 90 bucks per month to these people to cover the rest of this reliability and rate recovery. Well, you can imagine how well that's going over with a lot of the solar advocates and people out in there. So the concept here is to head that off and say, look, you know, net metering, it was an easy, convenient way to get started. Minnesota, by the way, was the first state to, to legislate it, you know, at least for when, you know, going back to 83. It's been around a long time. It's in 40 states do net metering. But net metering, once you get a lot of net metering, is extremely dangerous because it cannibalizes your energy sales. And how are you going to do your rate recovery with all the stuff that's tied in with that? So the concept here is to say, well, let's look at distributed solar more closely. Let's look at the value to the utility of distributed solar. And what is it really worth to us? Now keep in mind that, uh, I mean, there's all this kind of conventional, you know, voided cost that some of you are familiar with is saying, well, yeah, if I buy solar energy, then I, I probably don't have to build this other plant. But there's other issues. The, most, the biggest one really is that a lot of that solar energy happens during the afternoon at relatively peak hours. So it is at on peak, more valuable hours. So therefore it is more valuable than the average energy, your retail price, right? Or at least approaching the value of retail because it's more valuable than your average uh, wholesale price for sure, right? Because it's a peaking resource. But then it also does have this uh, deferral of other upgrades up to a point anyway that I would have to make to the transmission system, the distribution system, or new generators. Uh, and it, I might, you know, if I've got to, to, to meet some uh, uh, renewable mandate, you know, I'm getting green energy, so there's some rec value in that as well, and some value that. So especially when you start, this actually does have a pretty high price, because I'm, I'm doing these deferrals up to the point, you know, up to a certain point anyway. It might not last forever, but the early, you know, at least for the first few years, this distributed solar probably is pretty 
valuable. And I might net off what I consider to be any integration cost of that, but it's not much of a cost to start with. Now, there might also be other costs you could throw in here, and some advocacy groups actually are. They're, they're saying, well, we're also creating local jobs. We're, uh, you know, we're actually lowering the market price in the, in the power price in the market, which we talked about. Uh, it's more secure because it's distributed, so I'm, I'm not so reliant on transmission and remote generation. Uh, yeah, it's, this is not usually considered in a value to the utility. In fact, if you look at it, Austin Energy actually did a pretty nice one. And, and their, their whole objective here in Austin Energy was to say, this should be a conservatively calculated value from the utility's point of view of the price at which the utility would be neutral as to whether they were buying this solar power or delivering this energy to the residents from a conventional plant. It shouldn't matter to the utility one way or another. It should have no pressure on rates. This would just be a break-even sort of deal. They came up with a value of about, uh, actually it's 12.8 cents per kilowatt hour as their value of solar tariff right now. You see most of it is from the energy component, time of day energy, but there are some other things. The reason they have multiple columns, by the way, is just that because the energy might be more valuable to you, for example, later in the afternoon, if you actually have people tilt their panels more to the west and move more of that, that energy with these fixed panel systems toward the later hours, it might actually be a little more valuable, right, because you're closer to peak. But they're just doing a flat 12.8 cents as their tariff right now. And their approach is to say, I'm going to recalculate this every year. So if you're selling solar under this tariff to me now, that's what I'll pay you. I'll, I'll change it in future years. Now, future years are likely to go down because you get more solar. It's not as valuable to you. You get to the point where it actually is, is forcing a lot of upgrades you can't defer anymore. It's not going to be as valuable. But for now, it's actually pretty valuable. And I'd rather have people under this plan where I'm separately metering it, right? And avoid the, the cannibalization of energy sales. So it's worth something to me. Now, these, if you conclude all these other things, you can get some pretty high numbers, like you know, 35 cents if you include the economic development and all that. But if you compare that, you know, if you look at these studies, most of them are finding a number that's in that 10 to 15 cents range, if you look just to the utility side. Yeah, can Terry. Yeah. Any idea what their uh, retail rate is for the, energy? That's the, a really rich revenue. Their retail rate is about nine cents, so this is about three cents above retail, right? You think you think that's crazy? Let's look at uh, Georgia Power. Georgia does not have any state portfolio standard at all, but they've got a lot of people around Atlanta that really want to put in solar, and they've had a lot of, uh, of pressure from ratepayers and, and groups down there. They're a pure least cost state. They're mostly coal generation. Uh, and they were looking and say, okay, we have this public demand for all this distributed solar. Can we come up with a way of providing people? And, and they really wanted to do, I, I want to be able to give you a 20-year fixed price contract for solar today. And so they did a very similar thing with what they call the Advanced Solar Initiative. The key point is you're separately metering this. Now, obviously, the separate meters, I think, is a huge deal because I mean, if we're going to do forecasting, we have to have the meter data to improve forecasts. You want to see this in terms of doing any sort of analysis of your load. Uh, as long as we're metering it, we could eventually you know, control it if we had to. It could eventually be a dispatchable resource, even in MISO, if we really wanted to be. You can't do any of that if it's net metered, right? So they came up with a price. It's like, I think it says 12 in your paper. That's actually 13 cents, because I've just been looking at this based on their avoided cost, which is only about five cents, plus this value of the load shape, the TND deferral, reduced losses, because it's low, you know, you don't have losses because you're generating locally, things like that. So their current rate for this year and next year is, uh, is 13 cents. Uh, they've got uh, 45 megawatts of small and medium scale distributed solar going at this rate this year and next. Their new, uh, their new IRP that was just approved says, well, you're going to do 50 megawatts more each year for the next two years after that. And they're going to recalculate this, but it'll probably still be about 13 cents. So they're doing a couple hundred megawatts of distributed solar at 13 cents down in Georgia, of all places. And they think it's a good thing. And I, I do too. They, the difference here, they actually give people a 20-year contract. Austin Energy doesn't even do that. Austin Energy is doing a year-by-year -year rate. Now, keep in mind, too, that in, in either of these cases, for Georgia and Austin, it's, you know, you're still not at the point where you know, solar breaks even. 
given that you know the price of solar is coming down a lot, but it's still a little more expensive than that. So this is usually combined with some other incentives to get to the actual build-out point that the state wants. Uh, but you're combining this this tariff rate with incentives. It's so another key point: is you're separating the the tariff very cleanly from the incentives, so you can actually change your incentive value to reflect what you want to do from a policy side. And you, you, the utility changes their value of solar rate to reflect the actual value or cost to the utility of incremental adds of, of solar to their system. So Minnesota is starting this uh, right now, you know, and we're, I, you know, I certainly want to participate. Even if you don't see that much solar, uh, I think you ought to be at the meetings and get a feel for what the method is going to be because it's going to be important. The other thing that's interesting is it doesn't take too long, of course, before solar has different value in different parts of your system. So you could eventually use a value of solar tariff that's now down to a region or even down to a feeder and saying, the value of solar to me is much different here than there because of these upgrades or how, how it's built out. So you can start doing regional planning, you can steer people towards certain types of technologies in the future that might be more valuable to you. you know, so this actually gives the utility a lot more control than we ever had under net metering to uh, steer things the way that makes sense from an engineering point of view uh, for the system as a whole. Who is that, Mark? Clean Power Research? Clean Power Research, allow me to use these slides. Uh, CPR is a, is a firm that uh, they provide a lot of the, uh, the solar resource data, and they also have run a lot of the registration systems for people doing incentives. So if you, you'll actually, even in Georgia, like you'll you actually sign up to, to try to get into a system by going into a database that CPR runs. And they handle all the incentive tracking and all the equipment tracking of all the distributed equipment out there. I know them well. We actually use their data for, uh, for analysis for solar projects. Uh, so they're, they're kind of uh, a WinLogix type company focusing on solar. We, we work with them a lot, cooperate in a lot of things. So I can, I can get you information if you want to talk to those. They, they actually have tools that like Austin Energy are using. They, they took CPR tools to help you do this sort of calculation. Uh, Austin Energy had them adapted to the nodal ERCOT market to deal with hour by hour pricing, like we'd want to do probably in MISO. And in fact, I saw on the agenda for the upcoming meetings this fall that uh, Clean Power Research and other people that have been associated with the Austin uh, value of calculation will actually be at the meetings and presenting what they did in detail at the, uh, the meetings coming up uh, at the Minnesota PUC this fall. I think it was a sequence of four meetings that start in September, run through. Uh, November and the final PUC rule is supposed to be up at the end of January. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, let me wrap up. I, I got just one more session here to do, and then we can have like questions and discussion over lunch. Uh, you know, I, I'm known as somebody who has an opinion on almost everything. In case you haven't figured that out yet, and uh, I'd like to take this kind of all the way to the the extreme around FERC and NERC and what's going on with this. And I, I think a lot of this is actually driven by the same sort of forecasting realities that we saw, like with the MISO dispatchable intermittent resource tariff. Because the, the nature of forecasting and the error profile influences this, and it's actually influencing FERC uh, rulings, FERC orders that are out here right now. Uh, look at FERC order 1000 first, uh, more on the transmission side. You know, it really requires you know, regional transmission planning and considering economics and policy in addition to reliability and how we look at the, uh, the benefit of transmission build-outs uh, and very widespread cost allocation. You know, so this is really getting a lot of the renewable policy into the mix. I mean, here in the Midwest with MISO and uh, you know, what we've, we've done with uh, you know, our own transmission planning with MISO's multi-value projects, you know, we already had a head start of this, but even this is pushing MISO beyond, especially when it comes to regional transmission planning cost allocation at the seams with other ISOs. So pretty interesting. It really brings uh, policy and economics into it. FERC order 764 is even more directly relevant around renewables. And uh, what this says is that uh, transmission customers at least have to have the option of 15 minute transmission scheduling rather than hourly. Again, not a big influence here. We're already in an organized market like MISO where we're doing this at five minutes. It's a big, big deal in the West where they're still doing hourly, manually scheduled transmission tags, right? Uh, this forces them to automate a lot of that. We've also had a lot of concerns out in that part of the country of people say, well, you know, based on my view of the world where I'm doing hourly type issues, boy, if I got to have wind and I got to ship it somewhere else, 
I'm dealing with a lot of regulation. I see a huge cost from my perspective about integrating wind. Well, what, what FERC is saying is that, well, maybe you do, but you can go ahead and demand f data from wind plants as long as you use it to do a good wind forecasting system. But before I contemplate even allowing you to charge anybody a cost for integrating wind in the West, you've got to be doing this 15-minute scheduling, which gives you the more granular ability to follow wind. And you've got to do a good centralized forecast. You have to prove to me that you're doing everything you can to reduce the integration cost before you start charging it. So it's forcing a lot, like, like uh, another part of Pacific Corps. I, I, Pacific Corps is doing great stuff with the, uh, uh, you know, their, 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 uh, their work on the energy imbalance market. But they just had a tariff they proposed for exports from the, the, another part of their system. And they wanted to charge wind energy 8,000 times more than a conventional plant for exporting power. And FERC said, no way, we're not going to allow that. Because this absence of forecasting and doing these best practices would lead to unjust and unreasonable rates, uh, rates just as a matter of principle. So it's, it's forcing a lot of changes in the West. Uh, California is actually uh, very influenced by this because they are, they're so dependent on imports into California and they've been dealing with all these hourly schedules coming in. Well, now they've got 15 minute schedules. They say, okay, great. I'm going to actually change my entire market system to deal with all these 15 minute imports. I'm going to carry that 15 minute issue right into my inside market as well. So they're going to have three markets now. You're going to have a day ahead, a 15 minute, and a five minute market in California. Rather complicated. Uh, still some issues with it, but it's, it's certainly causing a change to be more flexible at the seams. And then other orders in general here, uh, like 755, uh, looking at faster regulation and, and demand response rulings. You know, they're, they're really trying to get a lot of this non-conventional flexibility into the system, right? You know, so should demand response be paid the full market clearing right, rate the same as a plant? Very controversial, but there's a lot of this discussion out east. Uh, PJM has a separate regulation product now. They have two regulation products. One is the conventional one like we have in MISO. The other is a very fast regulation, which is paid separately at a higher price and follows a completely different signal. And that's really intended to get you know, the faster units like, uh, like flywheels and storage and, uh, and very fast responding, very accurately responding units compensated in the market so we start getting storage and, and non-conventional uh, regulation products in. You know, all of this is really uh, pushing the concept of flexibility that we've dwelled on a lot already. They're trying to do this through FERC regulations too that will encourage the, uh, the support for non-conventional, more flexible types of products whether on the generation side or the load side in the markets. As I mentioned, you know, PGM has more than 2,000 megawatts of, of DR bidding in, right? And they're, they're getting more and more of those. Pretty interesting. And then, of course, uh, I alluded to this in terms of my discussion on the energy imbalance market. But, uh, you know, it's just getting more and more expensive to run a small balancing area like they are in the West. They've got, what, 37 or 39 balancing areas in WEC. You know, they don't have that much load there, you know, but they got a lot of balancing areas. It's really expensive. And the energy balance market is going to show the, show the way, I think, that, you know, there's cheaper ways of doing this by at least cooperating with your neighbors a little bit more in doing this. And we'll see where this drives things. But, but very clearly, you know, FERC is, is very much in favor of things like the energy imbalance market. They, they like to see uh, MISO type markets. MISO is probably one of their poster children of how they kind of like to see it done. And we're sitting right in the heart of it and we see a lot of the, the latest practices. But uh, I think you're going to see a lot of this. Uh, it, there's difficulties, lots of politics and history out there in the West in particular. And the, uh, the real interesting part is how this is causing interaction with the public power marketing organizations like Bonneville which have, and, and WAPA here closer to us, which have always, you know, under statute, they've, they view themselves as having a different role and having certain constraints, but even, uh, even they are being really uh, forced to start to think about this a little bit more as part of a, a market type uh, or at least a cooperation type approach. Yes, sir? So the balancing authority is, is an area that yeah. you need, need to balance load and generation. And much with the wind, the larger the scale, the more the air is tend to wash out. Right, right. Uh, the question is about a balancing authority or balancing area. It's, it, it's just a region in which you have to basically maintain a balance between generation and load at those seams, right? And uh, if it is a small area, 
you don't you don't get that smoothing. It's more difficult to integrate variable generation. Uh, and as you combine them, then you not only reduce that, but you get access to all those other generators to help you do that that larger pool. So you're balancing a much larger power pool rather than a small area, right? In fact, even uh, even when we did the 2006 study here in Minnesota, I mean, we still had what five balancing areas in Minnesota back in 2006, right? And uh, we we were talking to people even then and said, well, you got five balancing areas. What's the assumption we should put in the plan? And they were saying, oh. We're, we're all going to be one, don't worry about it. And in fact, we are today. Now all of MISO, I think, is a single balancing area, right? But it used to be much more fragmented, and it's just cheaper to, you know, it's cheaper to use the cheaper unit and share your, your resources than to try to balance a small region. Same reason why you would never want to balance an individual wind plant or an individual solar plant. You're just creating an artificially small balancing area. No, no economic or, or physical sense why you'd want to do that, really. There's also, just finally, some implications for the ISOs themselves because uh, you know, a lot of our, all of our rules have been written over the years, even in the market design over the last 10 years. We've still been mostly assuming what we know about conventional plants, right? So we think it's perfectly normal for you know, energy offers to include a minimum run and a startup cost and a ramp rate. Well, yeah, maybe it is, but uh, you've got to start looking at this about you know, all of these assumptions we built into the rules and are, do some of those eventually reach a point where they may appear to be kind of generator neutral and fair, but in practice, they actually impose a, a, a discriminatory flavor for certain types of generation. So it might not be intentional, but we have to go back and even look at some of these and say, you know, is there a better way, a better, again, this is all about perspective. It's finding an elegant way of doing this that actually you know, treats everybody in a, a logical and, and perceived fair way that allows us to run the market that we want in the most efficient way. But you know, some things are, can, be, uh, can be challenging. Like, like the, uh, the MISO rule is a, a great example. I mean, there's nothing, on the face of it, there's nothing discriminatory about forcing people to give a, a real-time offer 30 minutes ahead of the hour, right? Say, well, everybody does it. That's fair. Well, but it wouldn't be fair to win. That's why MISO changed the rule. So that, that's a good example of a case of a rule that would be facially neutral but discriminatory in practice if you were forcing wind to try to live in that space. And you know, we built a lot of this in, but it gets down to the ISO about you know what's their role going to be going forward. Uh, you know, there's lots of issues about well, we've got you know, well we're we're impacted by EPA regulations as well as market rules, of course. But you know, we're if we're shutting down this this coal plant, you know, there there are, there's certainly revenues that are changing out there. All these things are in play with each other. But uh, you know, how do we deal with that? What's the system of the future that we really want to run? And how do we optimize that system as the critical thing? And again, I, I, I mentioned it's, you know, I think a lot of our, our mix of our generators are going to be driven a lot by the public policy and legislative issues. We've still got to figure out how to run the system and keep it reliable and economic. And that's what engineers do. I think we can do a good job of that. And I think what you're seeing with the, uh, the enrollment in the college programs it's really never been a more interesting, exciting time to be in the space as we're kind of doing this, this next generation of how we look at uh, power systems and power markets. But it's going to be disruptive, right? Because especially this distributed gen stuff, uh, I think we got to get out ahead of that. I think the value of solar tariff, even though it may start out looking kind of foolish to pay you know, above retail, there's, there's, there are reasons when you go into the details about why it does make sense. And uh, I think we really have to look at that. It goes beyond distributed gen, though, because microgrids, you know, people are wanting to put in their own little sub-power system that can island for reliability when the rest of the grid goes down. There's new technologies with, uh, with solid-state fuel cells in the lab right now that look amazing. I mean, you might be able to just run gas line to your house and use natural gas with a fuel cell and produce below retail rates pretty soon. Uh, this, this whole issue about uh, there's lots of deregulated companies would be happy to come in. They started out as energy services companies. They'll say, well, I'll come in, I'll redo your HVC, I'll put it on their lighting, and you, know, you don't have to pay a dime. We'll split the difference on the reduced energy bill. Well, they're, they're now turning into microgrid companies. They're going to take it completely off the grid. Uh, data centers, big users of power. What are they doing now with Google? They're saying, well, I, I used to have diesel backup and use the power system as my primary. Now I'm actually putting in natural gas and fuel cells or you know, cogen, and that's my primary. 
the grid is my backup now, right? I'm not buying all that energy anymore. I'm going to produce it locally. So it's very difficult to stop these things because there's a lot of companies that are in the space. There's a lot of money pouring into it. So on the utility model, this is very disruptive. It goes way beyond what we talked about just with distributed solar. So how are the utilities going to play in this? Are we going to be you know, the ones that actually want to help people do this and to, to maybe finance it and, and install it for them and maintain it for them, or at least be the energy services kind of information company that ties all this together with all the intelligence you need to optimize this much more complex system? You know, or are we going to kind of sit back and say, well, that's pretty different from what we've done in the past. You know, if we do that, I'm afraid we're just going to we're going to let it happen to us, and uh, it, it's going to be very disruptive to our revenues and to our ability to run the rest of the system reliably if we're not really at the table and part of that mix. So it's a very interesting time, a lot of challenges ahead, but a pretty exciting time to be an engineer. With that, why don't we uh, take some questions? Oh, it has, it has. <laughs> but you know, well, I told you my. I, I actually had an association with power engineering all the way back to school because my roommate was a power of double E, at, at you know, Wisconsin. at Wisconsin, yes. But, you know, <laughs> but he was, he was doing it more because he thought it was, you know, well, this is a good, safe job, uh, you know, and I was, I was more on the computer side back then because that's where, you know, all the, you know, we were doing all this wacky stuff with microprocessors before we had all this stuff. Now I think it's just flipped, you know, a lot of the really interesting stuff is on the power system stuff. It's a great place to be, and I think you're going to see enrollments going up, and the university is trying to you know, do online classes like this so they can. We're trying to hire another professor. Yeah. We've already had, we've already added one to our, so we now have three full time, but we're trying to get a fourth. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> and I hope you found this useful. Uh, Very good. So. Very good. Yes, sir. I'm curious, so what are you using for your computer system? Out all these forecasts. Yeah, we, uh, what, what computing platforms do you use for the, like weather modeling and things like that? Uh, yeah, we, we used to use supercomputers you know, years ago, but now we've actually found that in most cases, uh, we can run banks of this, the, the rack-mounted processors like you do in data centers. They're, they're essentially like PCs, but when you buy a single rack, it's like 16 PCs in one little slice now, you know. And you just run a bunch of those. So when we're like doing a, a resource assessment for a wind project, we'll take all this data, we'll put it on 24 processors and a, a couple of slices, we'll let it run for a week, and we'll have all this data. Because you, you can do this because a lot of this weather data, if, we, if we're processing like you know, 24 months of data, we can run one month on each processor because it's kind of implicitly parallel. So we're, we're doing parallel processing on this. So we'd rather throw a whole lot of cheap processors at it rather than a really expensive supercomputer. Yeah, people are looking at GPUs. Uh, the, the challenge is more on the compiler technology and how you get your software applications there efficiently, but people are definitely looking at that. A lot of the new supercomputers are based on massively parallel GPUs. And you go from a, one chip that has you know, 16 cores to a yeah. chip that has 1,000 cores. That's amazing, yeah. No, there's a lot of good stuff. We're also looking at what we can do in the cloud, you know, the concept that, well, you don't even have to own the processors anymore. You can rent, you know, as needed. The, the challenge is we are actually running some of our processing uh, on, on cloud-based platforms now when we need to. Uh, the, the challenge there is that uh, you, we, we deal with such large amounts of data that just moving the data up and especially getting the data back down is the bigger cost than the computing is when you get into some of the cloud-based stuff. But we're looking at that. It's uh, you know, computing, you know, computers are a lot cheaper than they were 20 years ago. Uh, so we can do stuff now that we never dreamed we would be able to do on, right on you know, our own data center or our own desktop even. And of course, the same is true with power models. I mean, uh, people are running you know, models like ProMod and Plexos all the time for this stuff too. We're, we're working in the Department of Energy and as part of that forecasting study, we said, well, we'll work with NOAA. We'll come up with, okay, what's the improvement in forecast we can see from using this new NOAA model? But then we said, well, we, well, we really care about the money on this, right? Can we put together the, the business case, return on investment, uh, should you spend money to deploy this additional better weather model because it will save X dollars? And we wanted to say, well, what would that save MISO? So we're actually taking these, you know, forecasts before and after kind of thing with and without this model, and we're running that in, you know, in Plexos uh, to actually look at how does that change uh, economically the efficiency of, of operating MISO with a better forecast coming from wind. 
and you'll find some value with that. But that's the sort of analysis we're at these days. It's pretty sophisticated. What uh, you have in Grand Rapids? Office yeah. There, and what work you've done there? Well, Grand, Grand Rapids is a great place. It's very lovely. It's a very lovely town. But uh, yeah, why do we have our? We actually have most of our PhD science team in Grand Rapids and a, a backup data center in Grand Rapids. Uh, our chief scientist is Dennis Moon, a brilliant guy, uh, and he's been with this company way before I joined, uh, going back 20 years. And of course, back in the 90s, we got into all this telecommuting. You know, you, we don't have to be at the office anymore. We can live anywhere, and it doesn't matter anymore. And so he searched the state and said, well, where do I want to raise my family? And he said, well, I want to live in Grand Rapids. So he moved from the Twin Cities up to Grand Rapids. And we, we said, fine. And we actually ended up building this cluster of the PhD-type researchers around him. So we've got about 10 people, mostly, mostly actually PhD level, atmospheric scientists, physicists, uh, you know, hardcore weather folks. And we got an office right in downtown Grand Rapids there in, their, in the, what used to be the uh, incubator community development sort of center right downtown by the movie theater used to be there. So we're very happy there, they're, they're doing great. And uh, the community has been great to us, you know, and uh, Duluth has been great to us too over the years in terms of helping us get this company going. Make an sure. This is my usual announcement here. We would really appreciate your, your answers here. Uh, it has a, some stuff on the back. You notice at the bottom on the back. Suggest some topics for next summer. Uh, we, we, we tabulate the responses on the front and we put all of the comments on the back and the board goes over that at the, at the meeting in October. That helps us what topic uh, we're looking at for next year. If you're a PE in Minnesota, maybe you need it for other states as well, this is your ticket to get uh, credit for today's uh, lecture. So you fill it out, and I always warn you, print neatly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to re-enter this into a computer or anything. Every once in a while, the people that continue to add call back and say, uh, we got this one, we can't read it, so make sure that they can read it, print it, uh, and um, that goes over there, and um, you'll get a significant mail from the, from the university's uh, continuing ed department. So whenever you're done with those, just bring them up to the, to the front, okay? Great. Feel free to contact me if you have other questions or, uh, or want to talk more about any of this. Uh, I actually, you know, I spend less time now day-to-day -day operations in WinLogix because I had a good general manager there running that. So I, I actually spend a lot more time about how all this fits together, talking with uh, regulatory, legislative, Washington people, working with NERC on, on where this, some of this is going on standards and things like that. So I'm happy to, happy to talk and always happy to get other ideas. So thanks a lot, and thanks for all the hospitality here. This is yeah, great, so great room. Great material. Thank you. Yeah, lunch is served. <laughs>